Is it a little salty? Do you taste some herbs? Can you identify the specific herbs that you're this tasting? Is this cardamom. What is cardamom? <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> it sounds that fancy. Sounds good. <laughs> okay. What is the perfect bite? That mix of flavors, textures, colors, and aromas that come together in one amazing amouge bouge. Big ideas expressed in small bites. That's our podcast, a variety of inspiring topics to make your financial goals and dreams a reality. Brought to you by Clark County Credit Union for your weekly serving of food reviews, financial education, and life hacks that your future self will appreciate. It's the perfect bite of interesting information to start your week. Welcome to episode 43 of The Perfect Bite. I'm Crystal Price. And I'm Shannon Hiller. Let's dig in. We love trying new dishes here at The Perfect Bite, and Windy City Beefs and Dogs is a local favorite. Next, we'll discuss our first financial book review. We are covering The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel. And finally, for our future self segment, we're going to share brain exercises to boost your memory. We share a different locally owned Southern Nevada restaurant each week on The Perfect Bite with hopes that it will become your new favorite. This week, we're sharing one of my longtime personal favorites, Windy City Beefs and Dogs. Have you ever been there, Shannon? I haven't, and I'm sad that if it's a longtime favorite, where have I been? How, do we have it's a lot really, of them here? It's hidden. I only know of one, but it's right near our Tanea branch. Okay. So it's right um, off of like Tanea and Lake Mead in between like Buffalo. And that, hmm. so what's the, there's a big grocery store, Whole Foods, I think it is. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so right it's there? right next to the UPS store right there. And it's, it's just really small, okay. but you can't miss it by the big umbrella out front. It's like a yellow and red, um, like one of those beach umbrellas. Mm-hmm calling people in to get hot dogs All right. <laughs> so yeah i've been going there for years it's nothing super fancy but they've got the best hot dogs i've only tried um a traditional hot dog just you know boring boring <laughs> hot dog and then i spice it up sometimes with <laughs> chili and cheese <laughs> You're crazy. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the the location itself, they started out in Chicago with um, Chicago-style hot dogs. So it's got this streetcar vendor kind of vibe going on. On their website, it said during the Depression when you could get a hot meal on a bun for just a nickel. From there um, is what they decided to create a hot dog with a salad on top, the Chicago-style hot dog. So I have never had a Chicago-style hot dog. Have you had one? They're amazing. They're one of my favorites. Ew. I we have to actually made them at home because we were trying to recreate the taste of them. And I've had them in Chicago too, and they're oh, wow. they're so good. Okay, yeah. Try yeah. it next time. It's it's different when it says like it's like a salad. I think that's totally true. It has lots more vegetables on it and things. So yeah, tomatoes, peppers, celery, salt, poppy mm-hmm. seed bun. Um, I will definitely try it next time. That's on my to to do next time yeah, list. Check your teeth after. <laughs> that poppy seed bun takes no prisoners i mean you'll have all in your i'm sure the other stuff too i need to definitely um brush your teeth afterwards yes. but that will be my next time to go so when i went um on my most recent visit and really all of my visits i always get the um hot dog with chili and cheese um, which is about 12 dollars. they've got vienna dogs so i guess that's you know quality mm-hmm. the quality hot dogs mm-hmm. and um a fountain drink um to me that kind of just like the cherry on top for this type of a location, getting the fountain drink with the ice and all that. It's a true hot dog joint. I think my recommendation um, when you go is just spend some time in advance if you can looking at the menu because it is kind of overwhelming if you've never been before. They've got a lot of different varieties of toppings, different types of hot dogs, different types of meats that you can choose. Um, So just like get a little idea of what you want to get beforehand. It's not a very um, large interior in there. You can eat inside or outside under the yellow and red umbrella um, if you want. I've done both um, depending on the the time of year, the weather. Um, But it's always a fun treat. So I would definitely recommend you going, checking it out. Um, I'm a big fan of hot dogs in general so i will always have my fallback on the uh, windy city beefs and hot dogs location so is a hot dog a sandwich i would say it's on bread (laughs) it is on bread it is on bread that's true but no it's like a well it could be like an elevated sandwich Mm -hmm. yeah Either way, I'm checking it out. We'll yes, see. definitely do that. <laughs> Send us your recommendations for a restaurant or a dish to try at the perfect bite at ccculv.com. We're always open to new ideas.
For our podcast, I try new places to eat all the time, and I've started taking risks. And it's been really fun to try new things. When it comes to our finances, sometimes you want to just stick to the tried and true favorites. Our comfort zone can sometimes hold us back from the risk reward equation. Shannon has some tips today to focus on how we think about money, not what we know. My to be read pile of books is always so tall. I love getting new books, fiction, nonfiction, but I honestly do better with audiobooks these days with my busy schedule. I'm Same. in the car. Yes, it's just easier. Same with podcasts. That's why I love podcasts. But I finally made the time to read a book I've been meaning to tackle for months The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel. I can't even remember who recommended it to me, but thank you to whoever that person was. So the full title is The Psychology of Money Timeless Lessons on Wealth greed, and happiness. And this came out in March of 2021. And basically the concept is that doing well with money isn't necessarily about what you know, it's about how you behave. And behavior is hard to teach, even to really smart people. And this kind of made me even think of our conversation again, back to Lisa Chastain in episode 40, where we talk about more about like the feelings and the values behind money. Okay. Because we might know something intellectually works, right, from mm-hmm. a financial standpoint. But if we don't believe that or value that, we're probably not going to make that choice. And so this book uh, covers investing, personal finance, and business decisions. And typically, like those are a math-based field where we're looking at data and formulas, and that's exactly what we should follow. But, you know, he says real life doesn't work that way. We make financial decisions around the dinner table or in a meeting room, and your personal history, your unique view of the world, even your ego and your pride, other people's opinions, it all kind of scrambles together. And that's kind of what we end up making the decision from. And so I think that this book was so interesting because it just takes uh, 19 short stories and explores how people behave with money and teaches you how to make better sense of your life when you're looking at your finances. And using these real world examples made it a really easy to read book. I'm going to cover just a couple of the examples today, and then we'll provide a link to the book if you'd like to learn more. And I think this was a really good book for someone who already understands kind of saving is important, investing is important, but you want to dig deeper and kind of find out how to become a little bit better at it. You can skip around in the book like I did. The different chapters don't The short stories sounds good. Like yeah. I can handle short stories. Yeah. Yes. Because sometimes I feel like finance books are intimidating and they're just dry. dry yeah. A little boring. <laughs> um, this one used some really good examples. So just the very first uh, chapter, chapter one, no one's crazy. And it was people do crazy things with money, but no one's crazy. I thought that was so funny because yeah, sometimes you what, what are they What are they doing over there? What is my f- family member doing? And it seems crazy, but everyone has such a different experience, different generations. You're all raised by different people. We've learned how important that is, different economies, different countries. We all have different life lessons. So it seems crazy to you, seems perfectly normal to me and makes sense to me. And so um, page 13 in there talks about um, investment decisions based on goals and characteristics and that we would choose the best thing available to us, but that's not what people do. Economists found that people's investment decisions are heavily based and anchored to the experiences they had in their generation, especially their early adult life. And it made me think of someone who maybe grew up in a depression or a recession and how they behave. Mm -hmm. My roommate in college, her grandma went through the depression and we went to her house and she never threw anything away. Hmm. She didn't need to keep all of those cool-up containers for future Tupperware use, right? But she (laughs) would keep everything because that was such a big part of her upbringing and her young adult years that that was just kind of burned into her that you never throw anything away. You keep everything. And so, you know, it's not really your intelligence or even your education. It's just the the dumb luck of where and when you were born and what experiences you went through. So does that make you think of anything Crystal, from your own family, or does it seem yeah, true to you? Um, so I'm Native American, and a good amount of my family on my mom's side is still on the reservation. And for sure, kind of like that same thing, you don't throw anything away. And a lot of it, um, there's no grocery store on the reservation. Like, they've got to drive several hours into town, things like that. So the way they um, handle what they spend, what they buy, it has to do with, you know, how long is it going to last? Can I, where can I store it? Things like that. Things that for me, I probably don't think about. I'm just mm-hmm. like, you know, throwing away vegetables at the end of the week because we didn't use it during the week. And for them, that's not something that they're going to do because um, there is a scarcity in a lot of um, situations. Right. I think another important point is that we're all just trying to figure this out, especially when it comes to investing for retirement. It's a fairly new concept. Like I was pretty amazed 
really in the late 1800s, you just kept working. Like when you, there was a chart in the book that showed 78% of men, 65 and over, were still working oh. in the late 1800s. There, there really wasn't retirement. Um, then it drops to 47% in the 50s, and now just 22% um, in the 2000s of men 65 and over are still working. So this really wasn't something that was expected to plan for retirement. And in fact, the 401k, it didn't even start until 1978. Okay. And the Roth IRA was just in the last 20 years or so. So it's not something we should be having all these like you know, decades and decades of experience with. And so we're all pretty much newbies when it comes to figuring out our retirement and kind of give ourselves a break. (laughs) One of the quotes said, dogs were domesticated 10,000 years ago and they still have traits from their ancestors. So why do we think we should know all of this in just 40 years? That sounds good. It kind of made me feel better, right? Yeah. Like we're, uh we're all, even the quote unquote experts haven't been doing this that long. We don't have as much data or experience and even generational knowledge that's passed on, you know, Mm -hmm. from one to another. Chapter two was about luck and risk. And they said these were like twin characteristics, luck and risk. And he tells the story of Microsoft's founder, Bill Gates, and the co-founder, Paul Allen. And this story really talks about how those two factors, luck and risk, can really play into your success. So they had a teacher at their school Uh, Bill Dugall. He was a World War II Navy pilot turned math and science teacher, and he really wanted to bring a computer to his high school lakeside school. So this is a time where most university graduates could not even get access to a computer. But this particular teacher felt so strongly about it that he was able to get funding to bring this computer. So Bill Gates and his classmate, Paul Allen, they were at the same school. They had access to this computer, and they just become like whizzes with it. They want to spend all their time they can with the computer. And so talking about luck, like what are the odds that these two guys at this high school get a computer? And so they break down. In 1968, there were 303 million high school students in the world. 18 million lived in the U.S. 270,000 lived in Washington. 100,000 lived in Seattle. And 300 of them attended Lakeside School. So we had 303 million, and then we ended up with 300, of which one was Bill Gates. Yeah. So, like, yeah, that's just, you know, what are the odds of that happening? It's just amazing. So it was basically a one in a million chance for Bill Gates to have access to that computer that eventually led to his success. But he also had another classmate, a third classmate, and he would have no doubt been one of the co-founders of Microsoft. But in high school, he was killed in a a climbing accident. So that was a risk that no one could have seen going hiking that day. And so that's nothing that anyone planned, no talent or skill that affected him. It was just purely a risk. So the book explores more into that. I just thought it was pretty interesting to see how those two things really play a part. Yeah, I didn't know that about Bill Gates. Um, I didn't even know there was a Paul Allen until Mm -hmm. just now. Yep. Chapter nine is titled Wealth is What You Don't See. And I found this to be really eye-opening. It said spending money to show people how much money you have is the fastest way to have less money. And it's kind of the opposite of what you might think about. And I just found it so interesting. So a person buys a Ferrari for $100,000. The irony of the money is that now that person has 100000 less than before, yeah. but we don't know how they bought it. We don't know if they financed it. We don't know where they got the money. So the author says that there's a difference bet- between being wealthy and being rich. Rich is the current income and wealth is the income not spent. Wealth is invisible because we can't see people's bank account and the money they are not spending. Wealth is the expensive cars not purchased. Wealth is the financial assets that you haven't yet converted into stuff that you can see. And so I was like, wow, that is enlightening to think about wealth versus, you know, what we have in our bank accounts. Like we could be wealthy, but we don't even know about it because we're not buying the thing Mm -hmm. that our money needs to buy. So that's like the story. Didn't you say that there was like a neighbor that you knew or something like that and they let the kids think that they didn't have as much and then when they yes. got older next thing you know they're like moving into a mansion uh-huh. <laughs> yep they they grew up very middle class in a three-bedroom little house in the valley and then they found out they were actually millionaires so <laughs> yeah that it's just amazing to think about that frugality that you have to do to to get that a control over your finances right yeah. knowing you could have lived in the mansion the whole time but the book covers a lot of interesting stories like that that just kind of really make you think that it's not all about just the numbers and the graphs and the charts okay. and like the whatever the investing strategies are, but a lot of it is about just your own 
brain and what you think and what your experiences are and honestly the situation that you're in like the luck and risk example so there's just a lot of other topics that are covered and stories that illustrate I just thought it was really easy to read the stories and examples keep you interested and each one had a point where I was like huh like I could relate that back to my life or something that I've talked about with my husband or you know my family and just I think that it made me think okay frugality being efficient with money, these are good qualities, but there's so much more to it that I can look at from a, a psychological, like mental perspective. And yeah. it made me, mm-hmm. I don't know, maybe want to sit down and take a notebook out and be like, hey, hmm, let's this kind is of why an- I do this. Yeah, analyze yeah. this uh-huh. a little bit. And so I guess we're on that theme here with our recent episodes, but just thinking more about why you think the way that you do. And also the fact that like, it's not all just dollars and cents that add up, but there is luck involved kind of took some pressure off of me a little bit mm-hmm. with my own personal like investing and saving like it's not just a to b to c like there's lots of things think of all those people that invested in just like the stock market you know lots of money doing good Mm -hmm. flying high and then luck changed i guess i don't know what you would call it luck maybe the economy with luck um and now they don't have as many um profits as they might have once had right or like were you born in a high economy where everything was going great and so you have this like natural positivity of everything always worked out for you Mm -hmm. versus you were just happening to be born in a recession where like your family lost their home and you guys were struggling and so now you have a a different mindset you know so when were you born where were you born all that stuff matters and so anyway give it a read I, I definitely recommend it I'd love to hear if you guys have another book that you'd like us to to tackle and we could share with you and now a break to hear from our sponsor Clark County Credit Union members have received more than $70 million in bonus dividends since 2001 just for using the credit union services they need every day. Since CCCU is owned by our account holders, they earn the dividend, not shareholders. This year, we returned a $2.4 million bonus dividend to members with auto loans, credit cards, mortgages, and checking accounts. Open an account today and start earning your own bonus dividend. Funds privately insured. Next up is our future self segment inspired by the Happiness Project. Have you ever heard the adage, use it or lose it? Well, this applies not only to your physical health, but our cognitive health. I looked at everydayhealth.com to share brain exercises that will boost your memory for your future self. So the article that we're going to link in our show notes will provide a list of 10 brain exercises, and today we're going to talk about a few of those. The first one on the list that stood out um, to me actually relates to you, Shannon. Um, oh, ref- no. No. Yeah. <laughs> a test. No, no. You, you are, are on the right track for oh, cognitive okay. <laughs> memory help, is to refine your hand-eye coordination. So, mm-hmm. um, Shannon, you're on track for good cognitive health every time that you play tennis, right? Excellent. You still you play tennis once a week at least. Mm-hmm. Yep. So any kind of sport that's like um like a racket sport, tennis, tai chi, knitting, drawing, painting, even playing video games <laughs> will involve your fine motor skills, which will keep your eye-hand coordination sharp. So good job. Um, the next one that we want to share is to challenge your taste buds. And this is excellent for us um, with us going to... No, two for two. Yes. Right. <laughs> new locations, new restaurants, stepping outside of our comfort zones. The next time that you're eating something, Thing, try to identify the individual ingredients that are in your mouth. I know people do that a lot for mm-hmm. like um, drinks, like yeah, wine, wine and stuff. Mm-hmm. Do the same thing for your food. You know, do you, is it a little salty? Do you taste some herbs? Can you identify the specific herbs that you're this tasting? Is cardamom. What is cardamom? <laughs> I don't even know. <laughs> It sounds that fancy. Sounds good. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, so this is something um, that us at the Perfect Bite we can definitely try no, to do. And um, maybe we'll share with you in the next um, episode. Mm-hmm. And then the next one, and I think this is one of the fun ones, is to take a cooking class. Have you ever done anything like that? I haven't like formally, but I've had friends get groups together to oh, learn fun. how to make bread. Oh. Or we made a pizza crust one time and just different, yeah, teaching each other different things. So. Have you taken a class? I have taken a class, um, but one thing that I've done recently was over the holiday, tried to cook like a new recipe. Like I like to bake stuff and I have like my regular go-tos, but um, this past holiday I tried to 
make, uh, what are they called? Beignets. Have you ever made mm, beignets? No. So it was like, okay, pillowy donuts, mm-hmm. nice, soft, hot. Um, I attempted to make beignets. The recipe that I had was not great, but I did try it. Um, because when you cook, um, and this is why it's, it's on the list, when you cook, you're using several of your senses, like smell, touch, sight, and taste. And I definitely did do that, you know, after I cooked a batch. Okay, let it cool down. Take a bite. Okay. It's a little bit too doughy. Let's try this. Let's modify this. So you're activating all these different um, sensory things and it gets your brain going. For some reason, I like to try new dishes when people are coming over to eat. Mm, I don't know. I'm like, why am I doing that? It's because it's like a special (laughs) occasion. But then I'm like, this could be terrible. I don't know why I'm cooking it. Yeah, that was me with the the beignets. It was for a cookie cookie exchange and I was like I'm gonna be different I'm gonna bring beignets <laughs> and it didn't work out so I had to do last minute um, back to my tried and true uh, white chocolate cranberry <laughs> it was fun I tried <laughs> no, I haven't seen any of those lately Crystal Where's I'm making a batch cookies? next week actually okay, all right. so you guys will get some <laughs> excellent <laughs> And the last recommendation that I want to share from the article, which is not a part of the 10 brain exercises, um, is something that any of us can do during our real world activities. When you're driving home, do you have like a regular route that you take, drive down the street, make Mm -hmm. a right, get on the freeway, et cetera, et cetera? Well, try taking a different route. This will uh, make your brain work a little bit harder. You got to pay attention a little bit more. Hmm. Um, I think we've also talked about on the on the show before. You know, sometimes just getting home or getting close to home and like not really realizing how you got there. Yeah, scary. <laughs> You're in this like fog. Yeah. So get out of the fog. And take a new route, your brain will have to work because you're not used to taking Mm -hmm. that same route. Another um, way to test your brain or get your brain working is to brush your teeth using your opposite hand. That might Mm. be a little bit tricky. might get a little messy. (laughs) But it will force your brain to kind of work out aside the norms that it's used to. I have another one. Yeah. What is One time a business coach told me to do to wake my brain up. At your desk or even in your house, okay. move your trash can to a new spot. Oh, okay. And so just at my little desk uh-huh. at work, I had my trash on the left and I moved it to the right, like literally moved it across my desk. Like that's uh-huh. it. And it was crazy how long my brain wanted to still go <laughs> throw away. Oh, no, not there. Yeah, oh, throw away. yeah. And I would even like, throw it there and then be like, oh my gosh, there's no trash can. And then I'd have to go to the right. So just that whole like move to the other side your brain has to activate like okay remember we moved it Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so try that yep so these are just a few um like i said there are is is a total list of 10 we will link to that in our show notes and um once you get in a day-to-day routine of doing these exercises you're going to build a strong cognitive health for your future self Um, again the list was from everydayhealth.com We want to hear from you. Send us your financial questions or money topics that you'd like to learn more about. And don't forget any fun local food recommendations. Our email is theperfectbite at ccculv.com. Thank you for listening to this week's episode brought to you by Clark County Credit Union. For additional money management tips and financial calculators, check out our website at ccculv.org. Now that was The Perfect Bite.